All right, thank you, Kathy, for my notes. Our next speaker is Rudolf Rudy Tanzi, neurogeneticist uh, and science rock star, maybe real rock star. He's professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, director of the Genetics and Aging Unit at Mass General Hospital. When Rudy Tanzi was in medical school, every student in his class had to pick a disease to study for a first-term project. Alzheimer's was the last disease anybody chose it. Nobody was interested in studying it. Nan Tansy told the New York Times, today, if you did that same thing, it would, be, it would be the first to go. It's key to so many fascinating issues. Um, yeah. And furthermore, <clears throat> in 1986, Rudolf Tanzi was one of the first scientists to discover a gene related to Alzheimer's, devoted his career to identifying and characterizing Alzheimer's-associated genetic mutations in hopes of uncovering how the disease ravages brains. He isolated the first familiar Alzheimer's disease gene, the FAD gene, uncovered the role of zinc and copper in Alzheimer's disease. I'm sure we're all wondering what that is. Was chosen by the Jeffrey Bean Foundation as a rock star of science and recorded organ tracks for Aerosmith's album, Music from Another Dimension. He's co-author with Deepak Chopra of New York Times bestseller, Superbrain, host of the PBS show, Superbrain. He's currently trying to identify novel genes associated with Alzheimer's and autism spectrum disorders. Please join me in welcoming Rudolf Tanzi. Great, well thanks very much. Um, that's that's actually the most interesting introduction I've ever had, I have to say. Thank you all for being here, and it's great to uh, be able to share with you today some things that I work on. I'll talk to you today about Alzheimer's disease, and then segue into the brain. And then since I wrote a book with Deepak Chopra, we'll go down the rabbit hole a little bit at the end and talk a little bit about consciousness. And I hope at that point I don't totally tarnish my reputation as a scientist trying to cure Alzheimer's, but it's all fun. So. Um, if I could get the first slide. So basically, I spend most of my time studying Alzheimer's disease. Uh, my mantra is go from genes to drugs, discover genes to figure out what's broken by finding the defects, come up with drugs to prevent or treat the disease. We're doing that at many different levels now. For the last 30 years, I've been at, um, at Harvard Medical School and Mass General Hospital. Um, the second thing I do is I write books. I wrote this book with Deepak Chopra. Like I said, I'll mention a little bit about the book and some of the ideas in it toward the end, which are a little uh, different than the science stuff I do in Alzheimer's. And then I um, occasionally play with uh, Joe Perry of uh, Aerosmith. That's us on the Jay Leno show last year. I'm in the back looking bewildered, as you can see me at the keyboard. <laughs> Joe looking not bewildered. And uh, because of that, I do some studio recording stuff at Aerosmith, which is a very different experience, I must uh, say. Um, but today, we won't talk about music, we'll talk about Alzheimer's and the brain. So one thing in working with people like uh, Deepak Chopra, working with the scientists I've worked with at Harvard for the past 30 years, working even with the guys from Aerosmith, the common theme I found among highly innovative and successful people, clarity of mind, clear focus, clear goals, clear intention, compassion. I find that people who are successful are generally very compassionate and caring about others. They listen well. Original thinking, the first discussion I had, I met Joe Perry because GQ picked scientists as rock stars of science in their field. So they had Francis Collins, who head of the Human Genome Project, and I posed with uh, Joe Perry for a GQ shoot. And then when I started talking about Joe that I, that I actually play, and I know he must hear this all the time, um, uh, he actually, we, we finally jammed, and uh, then he said, you know what, you should come and play with us and join, join the band. So um, that's how that happened, but the first discussion we had was to talk about the fact that whether it's music or science, it's important to be non-derivative. Don't do what everybody else is doing. Take the re out of research and search, explore, innovate. Um, and teamwork, I think teamwork is a big, big factor among most successful people, appreciating that it takes a team, which of course brings me to the 2013 Boston Red Sox. And uh, Francisco, I'm hoping that tonight you can sneak in a baseball with that bounce imaging, because I want to see Ortiz's home run land on Lansdowne Street with your cameras. I think that'd be really cool. And I'm sure he would enjoy it too. It'd be the greatest ESPN web gem of all time. So um, anyway, and I should also say to Nina that we have lots of lab equipment that is lying around that uh, we, we need to give you for, for Kenya as well, sitting upstairs. And I, think with that, I think that's an incredible 
idea. I mean, especially when you look at the history of science and where we find the newest compounds and drugs, they come from all over the place. And, and uh, boy, you're really opening up huge vistas with that. So Alzheimer's disease is, is really a huge, huge medical problem and social problem. Five, over five million victims in this country, um, uh, uh, 13 million family members impacted, 15 million unpaid caregivers. Let me ask the, you, how many of you either know someone with Alzheimer's or someone taking care of an Alzheimer's patient on a daily basis? So that's, a, that's amazing. I mean, you know, it's just everywhere. Why? Because we don't die so young anymore. I mean, the average lifespan is now 80 years old, and at 80 years old, you have a 20% chance of having this disease. So one in five people over 65 today will have Alzheimer's disease unless we do something about it. At 85, it goes to 50%. 50%. That's five years just past the average lifespan right now. And this is a, a, an analysis that was done by the Cure Alzheimer's Fund, who I work very closely with. They're based in Boston. The best, by far, the best uh, foundation for Alzheimer's research. If you want your money to go to actual Alzheimer's research, and every dollar into Cure Alzheimer's Fund is a dollar out. They take no overhead out at all. That's covered by their founders. Um, and what the analysis showed was that if you look at how much Alzheimer's disease is sucking out of Medicare and Medicaid right now, then you extrapolate among baby boomers how many will have Alzheimer's in the coming years. Somewhere between 2015 and 2020, we're going to hit the tipping point or inflection point where Alzheimer's has the chance to single-handedly collapse Medicare, Medicaid, and our healthcare system if we don't do better. And, and right now, we just need, we're really held back by funding because so many people have such great ideas, but Alzheimer's seems to be the red-haired stepchild of the NIH, and we get much, much less funding than other major diseases, and that really has to be fixed or we're going to be in a big trouble. So this is just, you know, what is Alzheimer's? It's the most common form of dementia in the elderly. Um, it it it's, it's, uh, strikes, every, after 40 years old, we all start developing this pathology, very strong genetic component. But other risk factors, if you don't get enough exercise, exercise is the number one thing that's good for the brain. What's good for the heart is good for the brain. Um, it, it, exercise helps reduce the pathology. Exercise helps grow new nerve cells in the brain. Other risk factors include brain injury, stroke, any types of metabolic disease like diabetes and obesity. Social isolation and loneliness has been shown to be a risk factor. Emotional stress and trauma. A recent report showing that divorce in middle age is a huge risk factor for this disease. So as we become a society that's living longer, getting more stressed, uh, it's just even more imperative that we, uh, we address uh, this disease. Now what's the difference between Alzheimer's and a senior moment? And this is just, uh, here's some dinosaurs saying, sitting on a rock saying, oh crap, was that today? And uh, I know I came into this room for a reason. And I do this all the time. I'm, I'm sitting there in the living room and, um, you know, and my wife and daughter's in bed and I'm doing some work and then my cat's there with me. And so I get up and I go to the kitchen, you know, and I walk into the kitchen and the cat follows me hoping to get a treat. And when I get there, I just stand there like this. And I look down and the cat's standing there like this, looking around like, what are we doing here? It's like, oh, I think he came in here to give me a treat. I'm like, okay, so the cat gets another treat. But a senior moment is not loss of memory. It's, it's forgetting to learn what you were going to do. You never registered what you wanted to do. So there's a difference between not remembering and learning. And I'll tell you that in Alzheimer's disease, long-term memories are pretty much intact toward late in the disease. It's a short-term memory disease. And what happens is that when sensory information comes in, or as you're having thoughts and feelings, they don't get registered in that short-term memory area of the brain uh, here called the limbic system. So you start to lose that continuity of what you were thinking first five minutes ago, two minutes ago, even five seconds ago. It's a learning disease as much if not more as is a short-term memory disease. Senior moments are just examples of this, but they usually come out of just getting older and, you know, going from, you know, my little five-year-old girl who has wow moments every two minutes. You know, we were watching Jake and the Neverland Pirates, and she was so excited about some stupid thing to happen on TV, she put her head back and gave me a black eye with her, with her head and then didn't even care the fact that my eye was bleeding because she's just laughing too hard. You know, it's a wow moment. Not, it's, it's, you know, it's every single day. We remember where we were at 9-11 or when Kennedy got shot, if you're old enough. But then as we get older, um, you know, where there's not so much emotion um, consolidating that memory, we go from wow moments to so what moments. We start to become apathetic, we're less passionate, 
Um, I think a group coming to a meeting like this, it doesn't really pertain to you guys because you're coming to a meeting like this, you're staying engaged, you're staying passionate about learning. But this is what people need to do to avoid these senior moments. This is another one. Senior center, don't forget. <laughs> senior center, remember to turn. Senior center, wake up. Senior center, lunch only $4. Senior center, turn now. So, and look, I'm old enough to, to say, you know, we need these cues. We do forget to pay attention. We are either the bandwidth is high, we're jaded, or, or we're distracted, whatever. But that's different than Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease, it's happening because something pathological is going wrong in the brain. There's actually loss of the synapses, loss of neurons, and pathology that's accumulating. So eventually, there's trouble with speaking, with writing, impaired judgment, planning. You can't follow you know, routine but complex tasks, like following a certain recipe that has multiple parallel steps. Ultimately, confusion with time and space. And the current therapeutics we have are in that category of, well, better than nothing, but not much. They, they treat the disease symptoms, they help with cognition temporarily, modestly, the effect runs out, but they don't stop the disease from progressing. So to do better, our mantra, and this is part of Cure Alzheimer's Fund, who I work with and it's been the mantra of our lab, is use genetics to predict early. Hopefully that information is reliable, given with counseling, protected so you're not discriminated against. Early detection, if you know you're at higher risk, we want to tell you you're on your way to this disease 15 years before symptoms. And guess what? We can, we're actually pretty close, if not already there, in doing that with imaging and biomarkers. But most importantly, if you're going to tell somebody they're in trouble, empower them with a way to stop it. And that's where we have early prevention and intervention. So I've, I've been running for a while now um, the Alzheimer's Genome Project, uh, funded by Cure Alzheimer's Fund. This was a top 10 medical breakthrough in time uh, when we first had our results a few years ago, and we're following up on those. And this is very timely with this, being the, the, this year being the 10th anniversary of the Human Genome Project. This is the Smithsonian timeline, starting with Mendel, on to Watson and Crick, Rosalind Franklin, discovery of DNA. Um, the genetic code. And then one of these here, 1983, this, I was very lucky right here in Boston, I don't, you may not know this, but it was here in Boston at Mass General that it was the first time a disease gene was found using genetics was done here. And that was Jim Gisela, uh, and uh, I was working, I did that, was, was the hands on that project. It was Jim Gisela's idea. We did that back between 81 and 83 when we were really kids working over at Mass General. And that basically really paved the way for the Human Genome Project and now a huge amount of discovery since then. This is all to say that the Human Genome Project databases, technology, um, uh, resources have now enabled us to really attack these diseases of aging from a genetic standpoint, figure out what's broken from genes and fix it. So when Alzheimer himself first described Alzheimer's disease, as it's named after him in 1906, he just described the pathology. Plaques, which are these big bundles of amyloid, as it's called, sitting outside of nerve cells. Tangles, which are these twisted fibrils that form inside the nerve cells and choke them and kill them. And then the brain reacts to this pathology with inflammation. And it's inflammation in the brain that probably kills more nerve cells than anything later on in the disease. But for years, we just described the disease. We had no idea what caused it. And it wasn't until 1987 where we um, and others over at, uh, at Harvard found the first Alzheimer's genes and also in 1995, that now we had these genes that told us what was going on, and we had a clue. And what's good about finding the genes that are involved in the disease is that when you have gene defects, they give you molecular targets so you're not guessing anymore, and then you can now go into therapeutic uh, interventions. So example, heart disease, right? I don't, how many of you uh, in the room uh, have to, are taking a statin uh, to, to help manage your cholesterol? Not that many. You guys are healthy. I guess I, mean, I take one. Um, but I have a family history of heart disease. Now, how, that, how did it start that cholesterol, high cholesterol was a problem in, in heart disease? Well, the, it came, started with a family who had early onset heart disease, and the gene mutation they had was very rare, but it led to high cholesterol. And then Brown and Goldstein, who got the Nobel Prize for this, suggested that high cholesterol has something to do with heart disease. And now the People are using diet, exercise, weight control, off necessary statins to control cholesterol. The incidence of heart disease has diminished dramatically. In Alzheimer's, we have a target that came out of all those, those first four genes we found in the 80s and 90s. And that target's called A-beta, or amyloid beta protein. So that's this little baby protein 
that actually gets clipped out of a larger protein. So I, this is the gene I had discovered in 87. I called it the amyloid precursor protein. And basically, um, what it means is that you have this big protein, and uh, if, it's, if this is the, uh, my pen, and then this section here is, is the little piece that gets clipped out with an enzyme that cuts here and here, and that little piece comes out. And it happens all the time in the brain, but if, but if too much of it accumulates, it forms these amyloid plaques, and that initiates the whole disease. But the excess amyloid, or A-beta, has to drive the tangle formation. And if you look on the right side, that's showing how the tangles, once they're made in the nerve cells, in response to the amyloid, those tangles leak out of the dead nerve cells, and they infect healthy ones, and then those nerve cells form tangles. It's an infectious disease. Just like, like if you, not, not like mad cow necessarily, you know, you wouldn't get it from eating infected meat. But once you start forming tangles in the brain, they can spread through the brain and spread this disease. And it's initiated by the amyloid. Then eventually inflammation comes in, killing many more cells. So that's what we learned from those first genes. So in terms of how to treat this disease, I use something called the kitchen sink analogy. In the middle, you have a kitchen sink overflowing with water. The analogy is that's your brain overflowing with amyloid. So if you have something, a kitchen sink overflowing with water, there are two ways to address it. One is you turn off the spigot. Two is you call rotor rooter, you unclog the drain. And that's exactly what we're doing in Alzheimer's disease. Although so far the first attempts have not been great, there have been many failures, mostly because drugs have been rushed into trials because of pressure and need. And the drugs have either been not safe, or they didn't get into the brain, or they weren't particularly uh, potent. Um, but for all these reasons, many of the trials have failed, but we still know from genetics that hitting the amyloid is the first point in stopping this disease. We at Mass General are developing some drugs called gamma secretase modulators with funding from Cure Alzheimer's Fund and the NIH. I also have a small company I started called Prana with a drug called PBT2 that helps clear the amyloid out of the brain. We'll hear the, about the clinical trial from that company sometime uh, early next year, and I'm, I remain very optimistic and positive about uh, that, that uh, prospect as well. Now, we still need to do better. So we use the Alzheimer's Genome Project to get many more ideas about how to hit this disease, learning from genes and translating that into drug discovery. Turns out that we have an embarrassment of riches from, by, by now being able to do whole genome sequencing. You know, it costs $2 billion, $2 billion to do the first two genomes in 2003 with the Human Genome Project. Now we get a whole genome sequence for $2,000, from $2 billion to $2,000. So we just generated 2,000 of them. We go through these whole genome sequences. We're finding the actual defects in the, these Alzheimer's families, and we're getting this huge network of genes that we see involved. And that means it's becoming very complex. But now what we can do, and this is a complex slide, but basically we can look at the entire disease process and then looking at how the genes fit into the early stages, which ones hit the middle stages, which one hit the late stages, all these genes are now being used to teach us how to treat somebody early in the disease, how to prevent the disease, how to treat mid-stage, or if someone's late in the disease, how to stop what's going on in them, for example, the inflammation. And we have many, many, a whole pipeline of different drug discovery efforts in collaboration with other labs and industry based on what these genes, these many new genes are teaching us. So what can you do until we get these drugs? Well, physical exercise, number one, Healthy diet, Mediterranean diet, has been shown to be helpful. Uh, low fat, heart healthy, less meat, more um, uh, fruits and nuts uh, and fish. Uh, if you're vegetarian like myself, uh, just, just uh, getting protein from other sources. Uh, social engagement, call a friend, don't be lonely, learn new things, you're protecting yourself right now by being here at this lecture. Um, unless I'm stressing you out, because <laughs> You want to reduce emotional stress. Meditation has been, we have a, a project with uh, Alyssa Appella Meditation. And get eight hours of sleep. During sleep, you actually clear amyloid out of your brain and you consolidate memories. Now, I just want to end with just a couple of minutes on what have we learned from Alzheimer's disease about consciousness and make a couple of comments about the book about, um, about super brain. And this is uh, Alzheimer's patient August Dieter and Alzheimer's below. And it turned out, now we know that August Dieter had a mutation in one of the genes that our lab discovered in 1995, the presenilin gene. Of course, Alzheimer didn't know that in 1906. So he comes in, and she's sitting on the bed with a helpless expression. And he says, what is your name? And she says, August. Last name? August. Hmm. What is your husband's name? August, I think. So she's having some issues. How long have you been here? Three weeks. 
She'd actually, it was actually her second day in the hospital. And then after this, she broke down, and she just kept telling Dr. Lois Alzheimer, I have lost myself. I have lost myself. And, this, and as I read this, this, you know, this interchange, you know, heart, heartbreaking interchange, this woman was only 55 years old, so it was the early onset gene that she had. I thought about this fact of Alzheimer's and losing yourself, everything you've built up all these years, your personality, your memories, um, all the associations you have made as your brain developed from, from infancy, that's creating self, continuity of time. And the thing is that every conscious moment we're taking in sensory information and then that gets processed on our thumb drive, the short-term memory, which is the hippocampus. And that happens because there's this pathway that takes all that sensory information and drives it into the short-term memory. It perforates it, called the perforant pathway. And what happens in Alzheimer's is that pathway where you're taking that sensory information coming in, like you're hearing now, where it gets stored so you can remember it two minutes later, that pathway eventually gets severed. So eventually there's no continuity. The information's coming in, but it's not getting stored. And that, with that lack of continuity, that now becomes lack and loss of self. The long-term memories are there, and they often have to get you know, buried themselves there instead. So this means that self requires short-term memory, which allows this new incoming sensory information to go to short-term memory, and then when you're in deepest sleep, you get your long-term memory um, as well. Is that 20 minutes already? My God. Okay, I'll have to hurry up. Um, <laughs> so, so a lot of people say, well, isn't that great? And, you know, I go to these meetings with Deepak Chopra and stuff, and there's a lot of people, you know, people there who uh, say, well, isn't that great? They're living in the moment. Isn't that what we're trying to do? We're trying to live in the moment? I'm like, yeah, but living in the moment is only good, good if you know you're doing it. <laughs> okay? So, so, so if you think this is a good thing and they're enjoying this, please, you know, if you're losing self, it's not good enough. You, so, so this is what we, I just want to mention quickly about super brain. And the, the concept of super brain is that instead of thinking you're your brain, you're, to think about your brain as your ally, you're the user of your brain, to remember that your brain is three pounds of jelly. If you didn't have a skull around it, it's quivering jelly. It's sitting in pitch darkness and silence. Yet, through electrochemical signals, it creates your universe. It's, when you think about it, it's, it's crazy, right? This universe is made for you by your brain. We have the same brain, so as a species, we agree this is the universe. Bacteria would have a very different view of the universe, and it's just as valid. Theirs is just chemical attractant, great. Maybe I can eat or reproduce. Repellent, run away. That's their universe. We have fears and desires. Our brain evolves based on attraction and repulsion greater and greater toward self-awareness, self being the key. And so, basically, when, in super brain, just, as a, just to, how we talk about what I've learned from Alzheimer's in terms of how you can use your brain, we say don't try to control your brain. The emphasis is take time to observe what your brain is doing for you. Your brain does four things. It brings you sensations, images, feelings, and thoughts. It's the job of your brain, just like your stomach makes you rumbles when you're hungry. Rather than thinking you are your brain, think about your brain the same way it brings you sensations and images, rather than identifying with those, rather than identifying with feelings and thoughts, this is your brain doing its job. The real you is a gift of the brain, that four million year old neocortex, much younger than the 400 million year old brainstem, instinctive brain that says fight or flight, feed, reproduce. And take time to just say, what am I thinking and feeling right now? How can I learn from that and don't get stuck in it? That's the idea behind a super brain. So I'm gonna just um, rush ahead and just wanna show you one last thing, Einstein's brain. Newest new paper just came out this past week. This is Einstein's brain. We always thought there was nothing special about Einstein's brain, but now we know something. If you look at where that arrow is, that's called the splenium. Turns out, this is the region that connects the right brain and left brain. And the splenium, it turns out, in Einstein's brain, the, the, a wonderful super brain, um, was, is about five to ten times bigger than normal. And it's a part of the it's part of the corpus callosum, which connects right brain, left brain, that connects the area that's affected in Alzheimer's disease, the hippocampus. So what this guy had was an incredible right brain, left brain connection in the emotional short-term memory of the brain. And then you have Einstein. Highly abnormal, hadn't been noticed until this paper come out just this past week or so. And I just want to end with two quotes from Einstein that maybe his splenium allowed him to pop up with. The intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion 
to embrace all living creatures and the whole nature and its beauty. So a remarkable guy, a remarkable super brain. And I'll end there and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Rudy. Rudolf Tanzi, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. I, I think we could listen to you all day. That is <laughs> I was, really, yeah. I almost, that was I almost that great to do that. So. <laughs> really great. Really great. Um, just a couple things. With Alzheimer's, what percentage of people self-identify, you know, hey, something's going on, I, maybe I have Alzheimer's? Or by the time that comes up, they already have lost that level of awareness and does somebody else usually recognize when a person has Alzheimer's? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so in, in, in the early stages of Alzheimer's, the patient is suffering terribly because there's frustration about not, not being able to recall things and remember daily life is being impacted. There's agitation, there's depression. But then later on, um, as they start to lose self, as I put it, you know, my yeah. presentation, it's really the caregivers, the family members, uh, the loved ones who have the burden of seeing this person who they know no longer there. And sure. by that time, I mean, at some point, the Alzheimer patient is in the moment um, and really living in long-term memories, which are only affected very, very late in the disease. But there's a lot of awareness, not at your level, but there's a general deep awareness of Alzheimer's now, just it's out there. Yeah. What percentage of people come in at the first diagnosis, they come to the doctor and say, Doc, I think I have Alzheimer's. Is that common? Or it's, they've already kind of lost that self-awareness, even in the frustration period, I guess. It's really mostly up to the family and yeah. loved ones to notice something's wrong and to get them to see uh, their doctor or a neurologist. But the problem is there's not much we can do. So sometimes when I talk to families yeah. who haven't, I said, what took you so long to see a neurologist? They said, well, from what we read, there's really nothing we can do. The drugs that are out there are just you know, barely better than nothing. But I think once we can really understand how to predict this disease early, detect it early on, and then have some, something that will really help them, you'll see people running. To but the, you did the mention family. early detection is important. Yes. So why, if there's nothing we can do? It's a great question. Um, the answer, I don't have a good answer for that. I mean, why would you want to know if you're 15 years before dementia, if you see enough with imaging, you see enough plaques forming, even tangles, uh, you're seeing biomarkers in the cerebrospinal fluid to say, hey, you're pre-symptomatic, yeah. but you're on your way, but there's nothing we can do to help you. Some people want to know anyway yeah. um, for, for just planning their lives, but you know, that's why we have to work so hard so that we can match the early detection, empower those people. So the idea of curing Alzheimer's is really, let's eradicate it. Know what's going to come mm -hmm. and nip it in the bud and don't let it hit. If, if and when we can do that, one of our audience asks, do you approve of such services as 23andMe? This is this early genetic screening. You send in 99 bucks and they give you a genetic profile. First, and I have to know, how public is this statement going to be? <laughs> it's all on tape, baby. Okay. And every cell phone is a video camera. Okay, I'll be very diplomatic. No. <laughs> Why not? Because we're not there yet. That what we have right now are genetic markers that are common variants in the genome that are markers for markers for markers. They're not, I, I, I actually discovered with Jim Gasella the first five genetic markers in the genome, yeah. 1981. These are good for just saying, here's the gene that matters. But until you sequence through it and say, here's the defect, here's the functional variant in that gene that's actually doing the business biologically, yeah. all you have is a marker for a marker. And the, the numbers you get, 70% increased chance of this, or 20% decreased chance of that, are just fantasy. We're not there yet. Okay. So it's, it's more like fun and games. It's more of a Paula game at this point. You say we if we don't solve this data. by 2015, between 2015 and 2020, we're sunk. Our healthcare system is sunk, and that's such a huge piece of our economy. 2015, that's like five minutes from now. Yeah. Well, and yet it's the red-haired orphan or whatever you call it, the yeah. NIH. And you're going to solve it by 2015, Rudy? Are you going to do it? It's, you know, you never know what's going to happen with the next trial, right? I mean, really? One, one, it feels that close? That it takes one good trial and then you're, and you're on your way. Um, there have been failures for a number of different reasons, but we're now in our third wave yeah. of attempts. I should just say, in, in defense of companies like 23andMe, that even if you get an inkling, and it's not an exact number, what I'm, what I'm saying no to is the numbers they give are not realistic. Are they like odds numbers Yeah, or it should be more like a you know, yellow alert, orange alert, red alert oh, type thing. You really shouldn't have numbers. But it would be useful if someone says, hey, you have increased risk for heart disease. 
Yeah. We don't know how much. We can't yeah. give you a number. But you're going to eat one less piece of pizza. You yeah. might go run and you might be, take care of yourself. But that serves a purpose. So that's where 23 and me and these companies serve yeah. a purpose. Just the numbers themselves don't really mean a lot. Yeah. Yet. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah. But I think in terms of Alzheimer's, we, we are on our way. Um, I mean, it takes one positive trial and then a pharma company to scoop up that biotech company and say, let's bring this large scale into humans, that it, things can turn around in a minute. So when people ask me how long, you know, I have to say it could be a year before we have something promising and then, and then phase three trials. It could be five years, 10 years, or 20 years. But you have to keep taking shots on goal. And the only thing that limits us from doing so right now is resources. Shots on goal. We can feel that intellect, emotion, conduit wide open in you. And I hope you uh, go get it. Bring us that cure. We, we need it. I'm so Rudolf Tanzi, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. How great is that? Rudolf Tanzi and the science of Alzheimer's.